uh, yeah, and uh, today we are traveling to my second home, actually, because I used to live in Hong Kong, and uh, it's uh, funny because Marta and I, we never met in person, but I know her boyfriend quite well. <laughs> so <laughs> he was one of my closest friends, and uh, I'm so happy that he introduced me in a e-meeting this morning <laughs> and she will share a little bit about uh, Hong Kong today. Welcome Marta. <laughs> Hi everyone. Um, first thanks, thanks so much Nadine for asking me to join. Um, so like, I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I, I am a journalist here in Hong Kong. I've been here for about four years. And I used to work for a lifestyle and culture publication, but for the past four months, so since the pandemic started, I've been a freelance journalist. So basically, I've been mainly covering the coronavirus from Hong Kong for international publications as well as for local publications. Um, yeah, so I, I'm really in love with Hong Kong and I, and I feel at home here. And I know that it's a very special place and unique as well. So I think there's a lot of both like curiosity towards this place, but there's also a bit of like misunderstanding and confusion, I guess, especially because um, it's been on the news for so long. Um, so yeah, I prepared like some visuals um, to go along with my like small presentation about Hong Kong. Um, so I want to share with you guys what Hong Kong is for me, as well as like what, like some facts about here that people might um, know, might not know. Yeah, so this is the, yeah, the visuals. I think you should all see. Yes, yes. we can see it. Perfect. So first, okay. I think like the biggest thing about Hong Kong is that it's not a city. So a lot of people call it a city in the sense that like there's a lot of, there's a huge urban area that can be defined as a city, but it's actually a territory. And it's more similar to a country than it is to a city, both geographically because it's so diverse, but most importantly as, a, as an administration, because as you can see here, I put the passport because um, if you are a Hong Kong citizen, you don't have a Chinese passport, but you have a Hong Kong passport uh, because uh, Hong Kong is a semi-independent region of China. Obviously, right now, this is a bit like contentious, but technically it is semi-autonomous. So there is independent courts, um, its own currency, and basically its own form of government and even mini constitution and local leader. So Hong Kong is much more than a city. And I, can, I guess that Nadine felt it as well. When you're here, you feel like you're part of a bigger um, community and a bigger thing than just like moving to another big global city. Um, so yeah, this is the flag of Hong Kong, which is also like local people are very um, close to this symbol. And you will see it all, all over the city or all over the territory when you're, when you're here. And this is of course the super famous skyline of Hong Kong, which I think is the thing that people recognize the most. When you think about Hong Kong, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You yeah. think about the, the skyline, I think. Um, I don't know, every single time I see it, I, I really get emotional. <laughs> yes, definitely. I'm really attached to, these, um, to this skyline. Yeah, and I think it really represents uh, what Hong Kong is, because like, uh, you have like the shiny lights and the, like, the glittery facade of the city, and then you have everything else beyond that. Um, so obviously I'm considered an expert here. So I have, uh, yeah, so most of um, young foreigners live on the, on the island, which is Hong Kong Island. Um, Cause yeah, the territory so is divided into like, like a lot of small islands, the island of Hong Kong, and then a peninsula that is actually attached to China, which is Kowloon. Uh, Yes, yeah, so we live on Hong Kong Island like most of our friends. So there's a lot of Hong Kong that we actually don't explore on a daily basis. And there's also like a huge division between like the global culture and the local culture. And anybody in Hong Kong would refer to this like all the time. We all refer to this like local food. Uh, oh, do you hang out with locals? Like, do you go to local places? 
So there's really like a division that I think it's both fascinating and sometimes it's also a bit like, mm, like you can, there, there should be a bit more integration, I think, uh, which is possible actually, because you just need to take a ferry and go on the other side or like just try to, you know, make more local friends or try more um, local things, activities, and there's really plenty of them. So, yeah. Um, and it's yeah, so, this is obviously yeah, it's so cheap take the ferry compared to our prices yeah. in Europe. I think it's less than a euro to take the ferry from one shop exactly, yeah. to the start ferry, yes, because so this skyline that you always usually see from Hong Kong is not actually from Hong Kong Island, but it's from the other side because all the skyscrapers are here on the island. But the island and the, the peninsula are like so close, as Nadine said, that the ferry is literally four minutes. Um, and fun fact, even though Hong Kong is one of the most expensive cities in the world, actually often considered the most expensive, transportation is incredibly cheap. Um, the MTR, which is a subway, and every other, other type of, of public and private transportation is super, super cheap. So you can literally go everywhere very fast and it's super reliable and clean. And also Hong Kong people are incredibly polite. So there's no smell or like dirty stuff on public transport. It's really, it's a pleasant experience. Uh, but yeah, going back to like Hong Kong as a, yeah, I feel like the, what I find most interesting about Hong Kong personally is the hybrid culture that defines the, the place. Um, so I think that, well, yeah, so this is another part of Hong Kong that many people don't know about. So this is a beach quite easy to reach from the city center. Um, so yeah, there, there's plenty of nature as well to explore. And I put it here because I don't think that people often associate it with um, natural beauties, only with skyscrapers. Uh, but it's actually quite the opposite. There's a, there's a, uh, there's a nice mix of, of both. Um, yeah, so this is what I was uh, getting into, the hybrid culture of Hong Kong. I put here some symbols. I think you might recognize something Nadine. So because Hong Kong was a British colony for such a long time, uh, but there's also a strong sense of uh, tradition, um, there's a lot of, there's, there's a huge mix between like tradition, innovation and global and local that create this fantastic um, hybrid culture. So you can see like A in food. So these are some of Hong Kong typical dishes that you usually have for breakfast. So you have like a toasty, which is, very like European, but it's mixed with a lot of local products. Um, the super famous milk tea, uh, which is a mix between like a British breakfast tea and condensed milk. So it's, that's also very unique to Hong Kong. And then you have like this spaghetti soup, <laughs> which is also very typical Hong Kong breakfast. So uh, obviously beyond like the typical dim sum and dumplings that everybody knows of. So if you want a breakfast in Hong Kong, like a local, you would have this. But yeah, in general, you can see it in food. Uh, you can see in how people interact. And also, like, I think that if you've been both to mainland China and to Hong Kong, the difference is so, um, it's so clear between the, the two places. Even like Beijing or Shanghai, they're very global cities. And Hong Kong are very different places. Because um, in Hong Kong, you can feel the colonial past and you can also feel like the, very recent, um, uh, the, the, the recent part of, of its history when, it, when it's been part of China, uh, which was from 1997. So the, the so-called handover is when uh, Britain gave back Hong Kong to China. Uh, and it's a, so for Hong Kongers, that's a really, really like watershed in their history because, so you have a generation that was born be before the handover end and their families, and you have some kids, like teenagers now, or actually people in their 20s, that were born after the handover. So they don't know what it means to be in Hong Kong as a colony, but also like they don't really understand a part of it, I guess. Um, yeah, so okay, this is one of the most iconic uh, views of Hong Kong. <laughs> It's incredibly crowded, um, which is, again, very Hong Kong. Uh, and you have like literally thousands of signs uh, on, on one street. And this, again, I think it's really unique because uh, you don't have it in, in other Chinese cities. 
and it really is a part of the hybrid culture again like there are so many things that are like so hong kong like there's a 7-eleven every block <laughs> um there's like a disproportionate amount of food in hong kong which is both chinese local uh, european literally anything you can think of um but there's also like a lot of uh, traditional chinese shops everywhere so there's there's really a huge mix of everything um and these also like in uh, so there's soho on and central on the island are the most like cosmopolitan i would say and vibrant neighborhoods but even there where you have like where it could look like london for example or new york you still have a lot of chinese elements so even then it's very like um he has a lot of character and personality i think uh yeah so these are the um <laughs> the pictures that i sort of took like from um from the news from the past year actually so as as you've all seen on the news i'm sure uh before the pandemic we had a very like uh unique year here in hong kong because last June, um, the anti-government movement started with a very peaceful march of almost two million people. And since that day, basically, there, there's been a protest pretty much every week. Uh, during the, the summer months last year, was actually there was a protest at least every day, whether it was small or big. So our everyday life was kind of impacted by it, uh, not in a way that I mean, we didn't have any any problem at all, but you could feel um, that something big was happening, which both I think as a as a citizen and even more as a journalist, I think it was fantastic to witness. Um, so the picture that I put here on the on the left is actually from 2014. Uh, I don't know if um, how many of you are familiar with the Umbrella Movement, but I put it here because um, it was a huge watershed event. Uh, it was a three months long um, protest in the main um, uh, commercial hubs of Hong Kong. And it was kind of like, it, it's similar in some ways to what's happening right now, but it's in many ways it's different. So I put it there because I think many people still associate this movement right now with what happened in 2014. Uh, and then, yeah, so also the image, the other yellow image that says, we will be back, it's also from then. And in, indeed, they, they actually came back on the streets. So what I, by knowing like some Hong Kongers, talking to a lot of them, I also went to university here. So I had a chance to meet a lot of local people my age. I really think that this is, these are people that are so in love with, the, with their country or the place where they're from, that they really go an extra mile to protect what they have. Hence why we had like millions of people going into the streets. Um, most of these people like were uh, both in 2014 and um, during the, the past year, they had a daily job and during their lunch breaks or straight after job, they would go into the streets to protest every single day. And we're talking about like 35 degrees with like 90% humidity. Um, so it's not like a pleasant <laughs> experience. Um, but yeah, so I think like what I, what's been happening here I'm sure that everybody knows that it's obviously it's the people um, revolting or like more protesting against the government because they believe that it's increasingly uh, controlled by China, by Beijing, both with like rules and, and smaller um, interference and also from an idealistic point of view. Because I'm sure that a lot of local people might correct me, but from what I've experienced, um, there's a, a lot of people really are proud of being Hong Kongers and not Chinese. Which again, like it's a combination of a multitude of factors, language, because they don't speak Mandarin, but they speak Cantonese, which is also spoken in Guangdong, which is the region of China that borders Hong Kong, but it's, it's considered like a very Hong Kong language. And again, like history and their, yeah. And also, I guess the, mo the most important thing is that they are so, attach their personal freedoms. Um, they, Hong Kong is not a democracy, so they don't, uh, citizens don't actually vote to, ele uh, to elect their leader, which is kind of elected through a mini parliament, which is pre-approved by China. So there is no universal suffrage, but they 
are really attached to the to, to, to the personal freedoms that kind of dictate their everyday life. Uh, press freedom, freedom of basically saying and doing whatever you want, whenever you want. Uh, so I think that's the main reason why people are um, are really like protesting. Uh, yes, so this is actually this year, these pictures. And I think this one, which is at the airport. Um, so Hong Kong airport, like even before the pandemic, it was kind of like, for the past year, it's not been fully um, operating. Uh, it's one of the busiest airports in the world normally, but they started protesting there like around November, I think. Uh, so they decided to close it to the public. So even before the pandemic, when you were traveling, you were only allowed inside the airport with a boarding pass. So there was nobody waiting for anybody. Uh, nobody could come with you to the airport. There was not a passenger. And that's because for like weeks and weeks, there were people not leaving uh, with signs and protesting. Uh, so yeah, let Hong Kong be Hong Kong, I think is very, uh, it's a very powerful message because what uh, Hong Kongers are asking is, most of Hong Kongers are literally are actually asking to, for, to maintain what they have right now. So sort of like status, which is the so-called uh, one country, two systems. So Hong Kong, yeah, yes, is a region, semi-independent region of China, but he also has a lot of like, independent organs uh, most importantly the courts and the um, yeah and the, the the local administrations so i think that that's what it mean what the, that's what they mean by let hong kong be hong kong uh, so they don't want it to be incorporated into china fully but uh, i have no yeah. idea um how you see it but even i i had some really interesting um discussions with local people but also with experts and um yeah even their opinion about this is so different some people say it was clear from the beginning that we go yeah. we go one day back to china and some people say oh no um we are so against it and yeah let hong kong be hong kong so how do you see it because yes. I say i i talked to 15 different people and i had at the end 20 different opinions Yeah, I think there's clearly like, I wouldn't say it's 50-50, but there's clearly two schools of thoughts, or maybe even three actually. Because when Hong Kong was ceded back to China in 1997, uh, China and the UK signed a sort of contract, which is again, the one country, two systems. So technically Hong Kong should be like this with the basic law, which is the mini constitution and all its autonomy until 2047. Uh, so 2047 is when these uh, agreements should technically end. So there's some people that believe that after 2047, it was always clear that Hong Kong was going to be a part of China. So there's no even point in trying to fight right now because it's going to happen in any case. Um, so there's a lot of people that believe uh, that no matter what, you should, we should at least, they should at least as Hong Kongers fight for what they have right now and try to maintain it. And then there's another, there's another side to this because according to this uh, treaty or agreement, there are some things that China is doing that are not entirely uh, included in the agreement. For example, the reason why these protests, the latest one started is because China was trying to apply an extradition bill, which means that if you commit certain crimes, you can be, be processed in, you can be tried in China. Again, the lines of what crimes are going to be tried in China and Hong Kong can be very blurry. So people saw it as a way of China to interfere in local affairs. Because, for example, they could say, okay, if you uh, don't respect the Chinese Communist Party, you can be processed, you can be tried in China. So the law was seen as much more than just a single law, but like it's like a huge interference into the Hong Kong judicial process. Because Hong Kong actually uses common law, like the UK, uh, Australia, the US, like a lot of the Commonwealth countries. So as you said, like there's a lot of different opinions on these. Um, yeah. And I guess it's also like, it's fair to say like to, there's a lot of people that are pro-China. They openly are 
So those people are called blue. So the pro-democracy people are called yellow and the blue people are the pro-China people. Um, there are even some businesses, like some shops that have like a collar outside to mark their, where they belong. It, it wasn't put by the owners of the businesses, but by some protesters. So at the, yeah. <laughs> But um, yeah, so some people are pro-China and they believe that they, they've always been a part of the country. They were just colonized by the UK, but they belong there and they're, they're okay by being part of the, of the country. So yeah, um, the, the last picture that I put is, this, is the basic law, which is, I think, like the most important document for Hong Kong because it's, it's, it's the local constitution. So every single time people fight for human rights, um, for freedom, for for literally everything that they've always had as Hong Kongers, they always quote the basic law because it's the it's the document that they can hold on to as the as a, as a protection, or at least it should be. It should be. So I think everything starts here basically. And I know that a lot of people are not familiar with this because if you think of it as a city, you wouldn't think that you have specific rights because when you usually when you go to a global city, it's just part of a bigger system. But in Hong Kong, everything happens here, which makes it like fascinating, complicated. And I guess from an external uh, perspective, I know for sure from my family or friends that were not in Hong Kong for the past year that it also like looks very scary because the, like the protests were pretty violent at some point. Um, never to the extent that if you were like a stranger passing by, you would be affected because actually the protesters were so uh, considerate towards civilians. But it's scary to be in a place where there's like um, smoke in the streets or like things set on fire on a weekly basis. Um, but yeah, I think <laughs> now that the, the pandemic is pretty much gone here, like the, the virus situation is uh, under control, the protesters are back and it's definitely gonna it's gonna start again and it's, it's already started in a in a much smaller scale but it will definitely the movement is not dead so yeah on this side i think hong kongers are very fierce but what's your wish for hong kong what 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 would your idea <laughs> of a, of a I can just say because yeah, I also used to live in Hong Kong. I love this place. Yeah. It's one of the most open-minded spaces. We have also Rufi in our chat here. She's from Jakarta and we met two years ago in, in Hong Kong. And I met so many amazing people from all over the world. So I think it's really one of, yeah, a special place, especially because everyone is not really at home there. Even the locals have most of the time different uh, backgrounds or yeah, of course you have- Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so it's, 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 for me, I just found a second family there. So I'm just upset about the current situation, but what would be your idea or dream for Hong Kong? There's a quote about Hong Kong that I really love. And it goes, and it says, um, nothing is truly foreign and nothing doesn't belong, which I think it really describes what you just said. Um, and that's, that's my wish for Hong Kong for the future. I, I'm gonna stay here for a bit more, like, cause I really feel at home and I don't know where I'm gonna go next. But um, yeah, I wish this can still be true in 10 years. Uh, and for this to be true, I think Hong Kong needs to maintain the level of independence that it has now, right now. Because in order to create this type of environment, you need freedom of movement, of people, of speech. And also something that I didn't mention that makes Hong Kong so unique is that it's so easy to do business here. That's why it's such a financial hub and commercial because people are so attracted to this place. And every time there's like a problem with China, this is uh, reflected into the markets. Uh, this is reflected into how investors see it because everybody's scared that the all of the... Uh, the things that make it so easy to do business here are going to disappear. And also Hong Kong has special trade relations with Europe, with America, so nobody knows what's going to happen, but I think we can only hope for like, for as much as possible to maintain the status quo, at least until 2047. So that's my wish for Hong Kong. Yeah. Yes. 
I, I hope so. But how do you see the problem with Shenzhen? Because Shenzhen, 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 it's a difficult uh, word, Shenzhen. So just a, a small exp uh, explanation about the city. So Shenzhen, Shenzhen is really close to Hong Kong. It's really a neighbor city. And China tries to build a second Hong Kong with Shenzhen. So it's really yeah. now... Yeah, it's a competitor to, to uh, Silicon Valley, you can say. So um, there are some quotes like uh, when uh, Silicon Valley has a dream, Shenzhen already has yeah, developed uh, the stuff to implement the idea. So is there, can you also feel this a little bit or... Um, what, okay, I think the Shenzhen, okay, Shenzhen is a gigantic city that it was literally a fisherman village 35 years ago, or maybe 40 years ago. There was literally nothing. And now if you go there, you feel like it's one of the most urban and technological cities you probably have never, have never seen. Because everything is new, and everything was built, as Nadine said, from scratch, literally to create like a very competitive like technology and, and commercial hub. But the prob like, if we're talking from a like financial and maybe uh, commerce point of view, I think the Shenzhen can definitely compete with Hong Kong because it's impressive from that point of view. But there's something like Hong Kong has such a soul and a culture and a long history that Shenzhen will never have. Well, maybe in 200 years, but that's not in the, in the near future because, yeah, it was literally built from scratch purely to serve a purpose. So I don't know. It's, it's, an, it's a fascinating and interesting place to go to, but... And there's definitely some local culture because obviously there are people living there. So where there's people, there's culture, I guess. Um, but it would never be as much as a culture hub as, it, as Hong Kong is, I think. Yeah, definitely. That's also what I always say because um, yeah. Yeah, who has lived in Hong Kong and who knows how it is to have hike, a hike on the weekend on one of the amazing islands around Hong Kong. So just for everyone who is not in Hong Kong, so you have really the city center, yeah, Hong Kong Island and Kowloon side, but you just take a ferry and in 20 minutes you are on amazing island. So as an expert, you the weekends are always like a long holiday in the nature. And um, yeah, I think all these, yeah, culture would not be possible in Shenzhen for the next 20, for 30, sure, yeah. like you said, yeah, definitely. But we have a few people in our chat. Do you have any special questions about Hong Kong or what you want to know or you want to ask Marta? Yeah, I'm happy to take questions about You can also anything. unmute yourself or just write in the chat just that we get a, a small idea what, what you want to hear. Because I can just say, go to Hong Kong, uh, discover the place. Um, it's, it's incredible. <laughs> yeah, it is. 100%. I see someone writing. So, yeah, let's wait. Yeah. Amy from Cardiff, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's good. I love that I see your face because then we have a little bit, yeah. I'm just wondering how easy you found it staying in Hong Kong long term. What, one second. Uh, oh, yeah. You have to face, yeah. Um, I honestly think it's such an easy place uh, to be. So I moved here from London and the lifestyle pretty much doesn't change. Uh, they're both very global places. You just, it's very easy to adapt uh, in terms of practical things, especially like finding an apartment, um, going out, eating out. It's incredibly easy to navigate. Um, pretty much everybody speaks English. So it's, it's very, very easy. Um, I also, I think I had a bit of an advantage because I, I did my master's year. So I met most of my friends at university, which is, I guess, easier than, than just, having to make friends through other channels. So that, that, that was kind of easy for me. But I think as Nadine said, it's, it's such a great place because especially as an expat, which is a word that I'm not really a huge fan of, but like it's really easy to meet people. And there's a lot of like groups and things to do like in the nature. And also <laughs> uh, 
Um, and I'm sure that Nadine, Nadine can confirm, is a huge party city. So if you're into that, <laughs> there's absolutely a lot of fighting to do. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's just nice because you have all these communities and I think it's a really big family because um, I think, I, I have no idea how to explain it, but you always know somebody who knows someone and uh, yeah, so I can just say I arrived in Hong Kong and after a few weeks, I felt really in love and uh, I felt home. That's also how I, I felt, actually. It was so, pretty quick. Yeah, and I think it's a good uh, city to discover for because the visa, and by, uh, the visa is um, at the beginning three months. So in my case, yeah. I came to Hong Kong for three months and I checked out a little bit the environment, how to live in Hong Kong because, of course, Hong Kong is a really, really expensive city. I have no idea how it is right now, but... So I left Hong Kong two years ago and it was really um, apartments, um, eating in yeah, restaurants like restaurants, Spanish restaurants, Italian places is really expensive. Just the local food is cheap. I have no idea how it is right now. I assume it's the same, right? Um, rents have gone down a little bit because of the, of the virus and I think, and the protests actually. So it's a, it's a combination. Um, still very expensive, but I, a little bit. And then food, as you said, like local food is very cheap and delicious. Um, international restaurants, yeah, they're quite expensive. But I think it's comparable to London and New York. I don't think it's more than that, to be honest. Um, but it is, it's, it's a very expensive city, yeah, for sure. Just one question. Winnie, she asked, uh, how yeah. you cope with all that is going on at the moment? How you keep motivated with the protests and coronavirus situation? How is it for you? Uh, for me, okay, I have to say, when it comes to the virus, I was very scared at the beginning because being on the border with China, we were the first ones to be affected and nobody knew anything about this virus, okay? So there were like 10 cases and everybody thought that it, it, was, you know, it was terrible. And then Hong Kongers were really, really traumatized by SARS which happened in 2003. So the first thing that everybody did was let's wear a mask, let's not gather, let's not, um, let's practice social distancing. So way before the rest of the world understood what had to be done on Congress did it without any uh, imposition from the government, without any official rule. So from January until now, we've been wearing a mask every day to go everywhere. Uh, nothing, uh, public places have, have never closed, only clubs and some sport facilities. But other than that, restaurants, bars, everything was open. Um, it's just like a lot of uh, self-discipline. So because of that, I actually feel super safe in Hong Kong. And I'm actually Italian, I don't know if I mentioned it, but after what happened in Italy, quite at the beginning of the pandemic, I was, I feel super lucky to be here in Hong Kong. I think it's one of the safest places to be when it comes to that. And thanks to this, we only had like a thousand of cases throughout the entire emergency. So I think we're, it's, it's, it's pretty good. Uh, when it comes to the protests, I was never too, I don't want to sound like cold or anything, but I was never too affected personally. I'm obviously like, I'm very close to the, to the reason why the protests are happening. And I'm, and I'm really interested. And also as a journalist, like you need to maintain like an objective, um, view on it but you want to be a part of it just because you need to tell the stories so that's the way in terms of like it didn't really affect me from an emotional point of view uh that much but i am yeah i mean I'm, i really feel for, for for hong kongers but at the same time it's it's a great historical thing to witness i think yeah we had i think a lot of Things you said is also in the question, Wendy has, uh, can you also read the, uh, can you also see the, yeah, I think that's also one of the things which are quite difficult because I think uh, these political situations, 
you have right now in Hong Kong are so complicated and so um, yeah, even even local people sometimes have no idea what's really really going on. What's yeah, that's what okay, I heard. Yeah. So it's super complicated. Even local people mm. for them it's so difficult to really have an it's objective difficult. view on this topic. Absolutely, and also like when it, I saw something in the question that I can I can talk to my I can speak about myself. Like the freedom of speech obviously affects me like disproportionately because when I see like uh, that it could be affected or when I see journalists uh, potentially not being able to do their jobs, my job is based on that and I will always defend it like, you know, with every single power that I have. So that obviously affects you, but not just in a, from a personal point of view, it's because like, as I mentioned before, the idea for a person that has lived in a society where you always had freedom, freedom of expression of speech, um, and part of it is also the freedom of protesting, of, you know, like um, saying whatever you want and always manifesting your dissent against the government. If you've always lived like that and this is going to be taken away from you, it's terrible. Like the idea that this could happen is absolutely terrible. Uh, when it comes to the police brutality, that's also like something that I can say from my experience, like me and my boyfriend were caught up in a in a huge protest once uh because sometimes if you don't check where the protests were happening maybe you were around walking and all of a sudden it becomes like gigantic um and what was like for me as i mentioned before as well at the beginning of my talk protesters are so nice towards civilians i was terrified because you see the police you see the fire you see like uh, the the pepper spray that really affects your nose and your eyes in a second, even though you're even though you're not directly in front of it. Um, these people really try to help you. Like they're like, oh, go home, be safe. They're there to protest, but they they really help civilians as much as they can. So there's zero violence. There is zero position if you don't want to join them. Uh, and I think this is also it's really part of like who Hong Kongers are. They're incredibly respectful and polite. So this is this was fantastic to witness. And at the same time there was a lot of people running from the police. So it's a very weird feeling because you're running from the people that are supposed to protect you. Um, and it's something that I think it's relatable to what's happening in other places around the world right now. So it's, you really are scared. It's, it's a weird situation and yeah. Yeah, I think it's a weird situation all over the world right now. So, um, yeah. because uh, yes, of course, I also saw that a lot of Hong Kong people asked America to support them and they really ask yeah America help us uh, Britain help us but uh, I think all these countries are also struggling right now and uh, I just have the feeling yeah for sure we have really weird uh, yeah days or weeks months so yeah but um, yeah any more questions um, because a lot of people joined us a little bit later, so we recorded the whole talk. But uh, if you have questions, specific questions, uh, I know that it's really late for Marta. <laughs> Almost. No <right>? worry. <laughs> so, someone has another question? I can just say, go to Hong Kong, discover the place. Uh, it has so much diversity to offer in, yeah, in every kind of living so like food fun uh, culture and um, yeah and it's it's really not how it is right now in the news so when you see the news it's always yeah, for sure, right? yeah. never lived there I would think what a horrible Chinese place but um, if you live there you know it's the best place ever <laughs> Is yes, there... sorry, I'm replying to a question because I'm leaving my my portfolio with some of my articles in case people are interested. So, um, yeah, I will definitely want to, so, yeah, so also Petra confirmed that it's one of the loveliest places in the world. So, uh, yeah, maybe, um, yeah, I will definitely um, check Marta in all our Instagram posts and everything. So, and I know that uh, Marta is uh, a super nice girl who will 
yeah you can just get in touch with her after the talk and ask her of course. and uh, i'm pretty sure we will see you in some newspapers and uh, <laughs> i hope to see you soon in person <laughs> yeah me too thank you so much so if no one has a specific question thank you for joining us please stay all healthy and uh, yeah next week we are going to romania so If you want to have uh, a trip to Romania, uh, Maria will be our tour guide. And uh, thank you, Marta, for staying awake so long. And uh, of course, no worries. Big, big thank you. Kisses and see you soon. Bye. Thank you.